Who was here this morning, the first service? I'm talking about first service. What about second service? <laughs> awesome. I got blessed on both of the services. It was awesome. I believe God has something special for this church, and there's a reason why are we doing this. Amen? And I believe that God has special callings for some of you here. And not just to attend the church, but be a part of the church and do something great. Because you, can't, you can visit church, but you can be separated from it. Or you can actually be a part of it, be as a team, work in one vision, in one accord. Amen? Amen. Come on, I'm, I'm, ex I'm excited what God's going to be doing. I'm excited about the new team that God's going to develop, build. Excited for Roman, excited for every person that will be saved. Because I know when God starts something, I, I remember we have even footage when the church just started. I mean, just a few people out there and pastors just prophesying and saying that there's going to be... Um, the drug addicts will repent. The alcoholics will repent. The people will go all over the world from this church. And people were making fun of him when he was prophesying that. Now when we have this, we think, well, there's nothing special. Well, it was special when he was prophesying. And we, when you become a part of it, you become a part of it, something bigger than just you by yourself. Amen? Say amen. God is good. Come on. Oh, I'm excited to, to share what's in my heart. Um, it only will be just five things. Just turn to your neighbor and say it's going to be five. I don't often preach five points, but today it will be just fine. But each one of them will be 30 minutes. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Come on, let's go with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, verse 16. And I'm going to use NIV. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You earn... Um, Come on, help me out. Swaved by man because you pay no at attention to who they are. And let's read. Well, let's continue. Tell us that what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intentions, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the taxes. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And whose in inscription, Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar's what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. Verse 1, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and blameless to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform 
any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing on your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the for you being faithful, that you show up even when we are not ready because you are faithful. Father God, and today we, we came here with expectancy. We believe that you're going to be speaking to us. We believe that you're going to change us. And we're here because we are hungry for more of you. In the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, and everybody said, amen. amen. I, I call this topic... Simple, God's way, God's way. You know, the, the scripture says that our ways or his ways are higher than like a earth from heaven. It's not even comparable what, how, what's our thoughts and his thoughts, our ways and his ways. It's, it, you cannot even compare it. There was a story in the a, in a New Testament in Acts chapter I believe it's chapter 18. It says about a young man. A young man, he knew the scripture. He knew how to preach. He was bold enough. And when he was preaching in synagogue, Aquila and Priscilla, they heard him preach. And the scripture says that they called him out. They invited him. And they corrected him on the right way, or they explain it to him, the right way of God. You know, I can, I can know the scripture, I can, I can know how to preach, but if I don't know the way, how God wants me to move, I can miss the target. Now, everything starts, everything. We, we heard this uh, the Pharisees, they come to Jesus and this, they ask this, this tricky question. They thought, they agree that this question will actually, we will catch him. He would not have anything to answer. And they, they ask him this question, is it fair to pay taxes to Caesar? Is it right to do this? And I guess Jesus, Jesus figured it out and he says, bring me the coin, show me the coin. They show him a coin and it's Caesar's portrait. And he says, if it's Caesar's portrait, give Caesar's what belongs to Caesar. And give God what belongs to God. And the interesting thing, the Pharisees did not even ask him a question. What it is belongs to God? Because each one of them knew exactly what belongs to God. We read in a... a First chapters, Genesis, God says, we will create a man. And he created a man in his own image. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are created in God's image. Now, if we created in God's image, we belong to God. How many of you believe that there is God's will for your life? Come on, just raise your hand. You believe that there is God's way, God's plan. You have a God's plan. For Who knows exactly what God wants for you? Come on, just, it's not a tricky question. I'm not going to ask you anyone. <laughs> just raise your hand. If you know exactly what God wants you to do, you know his plan for your life. You know your calling. Just, you know what I noticed? In my life, in others' life, I noticed this, that people with the great callings, it's not a secret, we, have peop we had people here in our church, they get saved, and some prophet will come and he would begin to prophesy, and he would say that God has a plan for you, he will be using you, he will be doing this through you, this and this, he will send you there and there, and people will get fired up, they will get so excited, but after a little bit of time, they're not only forget about God, they forget about church, they forget about everything. And when you think about it, you think, why did it happen? 
God, if you have a plan, God, if you have a purpose for this man, for this girl, why did it happen? Why they stop believing who you are? Why they start denying your plan over their life? Have you ever thought about it? Why is it happening? Why is it sometimes I know God's plan for my life, but am I really fulfilling God's plan in, in my life? Are you fulfilling God's plan for your life? Or are you still waiting, waiting for God to start using you? Just, you don't have to raise your hand. Just answer it to yourself. Are you fulfilling or are you still waiting? Now, waiting for God, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, if you're not... If you're not doing anything, if you're not trying to do anything. I believe if, like Jesus says, whatever belongs to God, give God God. When you give yourself to God, sincerely, 100%, you give yourself. Like we read Romans. Apostle Paul says, now I beg you, put yourself on the altar because this is your your spiritual act of worship. Spiritual act of worship, it's not when, when we have a, such a great worship team and they, they're leading us into worship and we, we learn how to raise our hands, we learn how to shout, we learn how to sing, we learn how to do everything perfectly. But the spiritual act of worship, it's when you made a decision that I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I'm, I'm just going to lay myself before God and I'm going to allow him to use me as he wish. And you give yourself. Now Apostle Paul says, number one, number one, if you, if you make a nose, you can do it. Do not conform any longer or do not shape any longer to the pattern of this world. Number one. Apostle Paul gives advice and he says, do not do this. Now, Apostle John, in his letter, he writes and he says, if you love the world, then you hate God. You can't mix those, thi those two things together. You can't. You can't have a little bit of, of Jesus on Sunday and then live whatever you want to live for the rest of the week. You can't mix those things. Apostle Paul, if you, he didn't, he didn't even say if you, if you sin, then you hate God. He says if you, if you love the world, if, if you just sympathize, am I saying? Sympathize this world, then you hate God. If you have something that you, you when you look at it and you wish, man, I wish we could, thou could be allowed in Christianity. You know, Christianity, it's not the rules. There's nothing, has, I mean, there's nothing with the rules. I mean, yes, we do live according to the scripture, but it's not set of a rules. Because when God gave a rules to Israelites, they failed. Every rule that God gave, every rule, they failed. That's, that was the reason that God sends his son. And now we live even higher standards than God gave to Israelites because he gives us his grace. Now Apostle Paul says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't shape yourself. Don't allow this world to affect you. You know, Oftentimes we get so inspired and we, we're desperate to know what God has for me. What did God has for me? And we, we, we put everything aside. We just want to find out what God has for me. And then when God tells us through the man of God, through the prophecy, whatever, God speaks to your heart and he says, you will become a missionary. And you get so fired up that I'm going to become a missionary. And you forget about everything else. What God wants you to do. And then oftentimes we fail. Now, for us not to fail, but for us to fulfill God's plan in our life. To know his will in our life. Apostle Paul gives advice and he says, first put yourself 
on the altar, become a spiritual worshiper. Then he says, don't transform to the pattern of this world. And the second thing he says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind, your thoughts, your will has to be renewed by the scripture. Let's go with me to the uh, book of John chapter 8. John 8, and Jesus is speaking to a crowd that just got, they believe that he is God. And he says this, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free if you hold to my teaching you are really my disciple you know I noticed lately we really rare preach on discipleship you might disagree with me but we used a different term we use leadership you know and I noticed that the the message towards the leadership and the message towards disciples, they're different. If a person decides that he wants to be a leader, he puts himself above everybody else. And to raise a leader, you have to always encourage him, always inspire him, always have to tell him that he's capable, he, he will do it, he'll... But a person that puts himself as a disciple. You know, Apostle Paul was, he was a disciple of this great teacher. And he says, I was a disciple by his knees. He was learning. Disciple puts himself in the position of learning, of being corrected. Disciple is not, is not always being encouraged all the time. Disciple is always oftentimes being corrected than just being encouraged. You know, in our days, if you correct somebody, they get offended and they say, well, you didn't encourage me the way you're supposed to encourage me. You know, sometimes the scripture does not encourage us at all. The scriptures rebuke us oftentimes. And it's fine. When we allow the Holy Spirit, because the Holy S Jesus says he will come and he will teach you. In other words, he will come and he will guide you. He will correct you. He will discipline you. The scripture says he who, who, he who loves or those who he loves, he corrects. Those who he loves, he disciplines. And I have to understand, if I want to become his disciple, first of all, I have to hold on. Hold on, like uh, uh, Jesus says, if you hold... To my teaching, you are truly my disciple. You are really my disciple. If, I, if I'm holding on what Jesus has been teaching. Now, and then Jesus says, and then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a really unique principle that Jesus is trying to show them. And he says, if you hold on to the scripture, to the words that I say, then you will know the truth. Now, oftentimes we see, in a, especially in the Old Testament, it says, Isaac took Rebekah, they went into the tent, and he knew Rebekah. Paznal. Huh? How do you say? In, in, huh? New. So when you hold on to the scripture, you might don't get it right away. You might know. You, you might don't understand right away. But when you hold it on, 
when you hold holding on to that scripture, that scripture becomes a revelation inside of you. I, I've been, I mean, I share this testimony oftentimes and I see people using the scripture become free from addictions in their life. When you have addiction and you hold on to the scripture and you might still fall once again and again and again but you still holding on to the scripture and then boom the scripture becomes alive inside of you and you and the like Jesus and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. And I and I I I understand that there's deliverance that you have to come to 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 a leaders pastors pray together but there's a there's a freedom that you have to experience in from inside of you now the inside when when you become free from inside that's your that's your spiritual growth that's when you begin to grow and that's why Jesus says when you know the truth and the truth will set you free let's go on let's go back to Romans Actually, let's, it's okay, let's, number three, God will, in Romans, Apostle Paul says, good will of God, good will. That's when, that's when we first step, that's we, when we see that God has a will. And he has three wills. Number one, it's a good will. Number two, it's a, it's a pleasing will. And number three, it's a perfect will. And I believe number, number one, the good will is, it's, let's open the, or you don't have to, I'll, I'll do it myself. Apostle Paul says in Thessalonians, he says this. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that such of you should learn to control his own body. In a way that is holy and honorable. That's a, that's a good will. A, God's good will for you. First of all, that you get saved. Second of all, that you get sanctified. Third, that you, you, you grow in righteousness. And, and the, the interesting thing, if we begin to avoid those things because when we get saved we get excited but when we get when we begin God God begins to lead us through sanctification and begins to reveal his righteousness in us the only way to reveal his righteousness we have to die for ourselves each day there's no other way and that's why oftentimes we say it's a long process I'd rather use something quick. I'd rather, I'd rather just go for it. And we fall. But Apostle Paul gives, a, gives a advice before we begin to do a, the pleasing will. He says, hey, there's a, there's a good will for you. And the good will is this, that you get saved, you get sanctified, you get righteous before God. You, get, you begin to build yourself. And then the perfect will. Now the... The, the pleasing, pleasing will, Apostle Paul says, pleasing will to God, not always to us. The pleasing will that we read in Romans, it's not always pleasing to us. See, it's, it's impossible to do a pleasing will for God without doing good will. You won't, you won't be able to do it. Because pleasing will, that's when you understand what is pleasing for him. Pleasing will, when, that's when Jesus was saying, before he went to the cross, that's when Jesus was saying, God, not my will, but your will be done. 
that's the moment when you begin to say, God, it's not me anymore, but you. I want you to show up. I want you to do something. I want you to change my life. Can I have a worship team? Seniors and musicians. We're going to pray in a, in a little bit, but I, I want to go back to John chapter 8. The interesting thing, when Jesus is talking to, to believers, and when he's saying that they, they will know the truth, and the truth will set them free, and they, they, they just blow up at him, and they begin to say, we were never slaves to anywhere because we are descendants of Abraham. And Jesus says this. He says, I know you guys are descendants. He says, I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me. Believers. They just believed. But yet Jesus says, hey, I know that you are descendants, but you are ready to kill me. And the reason why they were ready to kill him is this. I am telling you, what I have seen the, uh, in the Father's presence, and you do want, uh, excuse me. I know you, you are descendants of Ab descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my words. Because you have no room for my words. Do we have a room for God's word? You know, oftentimes we hear the word and we don't hear the word. We hear the preacher, we're here, but we're not here. And Jesus says, the reason why you still want to kill me, this, the reason why you, you still don't believe me, because you have no room for my words. You know, if if we don't have a room for his word, we will never know the truth. Never. You might get excited about something, but eventually it will disappear. But the truth to experience, to become a true testimony, you have to experience yourself. The truth. And if there's room in your heart, what's in your heart? You know, if, if this bottle was full, it's impossible to add water into this bottle. It's impossible. It's impossible to add God's word into our heart if we're full with something. Now, what's your, what's your source? What, how are you filling yourself and what, with what are you filling yourself? You know, if, if I spend so much time just watching movies, being on Facebook, Instagram, and then I get offended because the worship team comes out and they tell us, let's raise our hands. Let's pray. And I don't have a prayer. I don't have, I don't have uh, boldness to raise my hands because I've been filling myself with a bunch of garbage. And that's the reason why we, we don't have boldness. That's the reason why we don't have prayer life. Because we've been filling ourselves with something different. And Jesus says, the reason why you want to still kill me is because you don't have no room for my words. And the perfect will is this. Jesus says, I will go and I will prepare a house for you. You know, the, the other day when I was reading this, I noticed this. Jesus says, I will go and I will prepare. And I began to think, and I noticed this, that God created the earth in six days, including us. He created the planet and then he created us. And he says, it's good. And then he rested. But you know what got me excited? Is that Jesus still preparing. 
It's been 2,000 years and he's still preparing. And I believe if he prepared something great that we still enjoy the earth in six days, we will enjoy eternity and what he prepared for us the whole eternity. And, and we, will have, we, will, we will never get tired to worship him. You know, just think about if God did such an amazing job in a few days, we still go out, we still take pictures, we still put on Facebook, Instagram, because we think we saw something great. But there's something greater is waiting for us. And Jesus says, I will go and I will prepare. I will go and I will prepare. And he's still preparing. And the moment he prepares, he will come down and he will take us home. And Jesus, Apostle Paul says, I, I beg you, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. You know, I notice that oftentimes we as a youth, we're not really excited that, about Jesus is coming back. We still want to live on this earth. We still want to enjoy it. We still want to have fun. We're not ready. We're just not ready. How many of you will be excited that Jesus will come in a half an hour? I mean, you're just going to start pulling out all this list and start writing down all those sins that you've, I mean, I'm pretty sure we're all going to be on our knees repenting, make sure he takes us. Amen. You know, I, I noticed this thing and I saw some interviews on, on the church that is being persecuted in Iraq. I mean, thousands and thousands in our days, while we enjoy, go have fun, go drink coffee, uh, have family times, those people are being killed. And then notice this, that for them, for them, the earth does not mean anything because they are, like no one else, are ready for eternity. You know, sometimes something has to happen in our life that this earth will lose all effect on our life. That's why Apostle Paul, when he starts and he says, don't be, don't be, don't shape your life to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, but be transformed. It's impossible to fulfill God's will in our life without being transformed. If we attach to this earth, if we attach to everything that happens around us, if it, if it affects us, there is no way I can affect my school. If whatever they're doing, that actually you have no problem with it, then you're no different from them. But if we, if we being like a, uh, when the angel came to Joshua, he says, Joshua, be courageous, be bold, because the land, I'm, I'm, I already gave it to you, and you're about to lead my people into the promised land. You know, when we are different, God gives us a promise, and he gives us people to lead them into the promised land. There's people that God has a plan for them and he has planned for you and he has your the plan is for you to lead them into the promised land you know they're 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 going through hard times but you are there for a reason you are there for a reason because God wants to use you to lead them to the promised land can we all stand I know that the school is started. I know that we are facing different challenges in our schools and in colleges, whatever you go to. We, we do face those, those things each day. Each day. But 
God has a plan for you. You might say, well, I'm, I'm too young. I, I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to do this and this and this. I'll tell you all this that you cannot do. This is actually your strong. You know, when, when God says, I will turn their weaknesses into their strength. You know, the, the more weaknesses you have, the more strength you will have. Because every time when we acknowledge that we are weak, we become strong. He turns around our weaknesses and He makes them strong. I want every student, if you're here, if, if, you, if you go to school, uh, if you go to college, it's cool. Just come forward right now. We want to we pray together. And I know that God has something special for you. You know, you might not hear something. Oh, you have to start a prayer club. You have to do this and this. No, just begin to pray and say, God, why, why you, how you want me to use? I'm, I'm willing to lay myself on the altar. I want to lay myself on the altar. And I, and I believe that God has something special. Maybe you have your own idea how God will use you. But God has His own plan. And His plans are bigger. His ways are bigger. His, His, His thoughts are bigger than ours.